So we start uh, this second day and uh, the first talk uh, is about the heavy quark diffusion coefficient from lattice QCD uh, and will be Leno to, to talk about it. He's already in because... Yes, so no, please go ahead, share your slides. Okay. And, uh... okay, you can see that. So, I can start. So, yeah, thanks for the possibility of giving this talk. I'm going to talk about heavy quark diffusion coefficient from the lattice QCD. It's based on this paper we published with the, this group of people. Now, just for a brief motivation, if we look at the heavy quark diffusion coefficient kappa, as a function of temperature, different orders of perturbation theory, we see that there is a huge variation in the scales. And hence, we need some non perturbative improvement. Now, the traditional approach of measuring this from the current current correlators from the lattice has a transport peak, as we learned yesterday from Peter's talk. So instead, what people usually do is we use this heavy quark effective field theory inspired Euclidean correlator, where we have two Euclidean fields, chromo, chromo electric fields connected by two Wilson lines and then normalized by a polyatom loop. Because this is a lattice and the electric fields have a finite size, it needs to be renormalized. And for that, we use this one loop result from Christensen and Leine from 2016. And since it's an Euclidean correlator to get kappa, we need to invert the spectral function with the usual thermal kernel. Now, instead of using some fancy method for inversion of the integral equation, we instead create multiple models for the spectral function then vary kappa and then compare to the Euclidean correlator data and see how it compares. And from that, we can extract kappa. Here are the lattice parameters. We are using a multi-level algorithm to do the simulation. Because the multi-level is only available in pure case, these simulations are quenched and they are based on the code by Panneri et al, which was the previous measurement of heavy quark diffusion and lattice. We use 2,000 sub-updates and four sub-lattices for the multi-level algorithm. And we have a very large, a wide range of temperatures compared to the previous results, which focused more on the 1.5 TC regime. Here are the lattices we have from 1.1 to 10,000 TC. And we mostly use this 48 cube spatial size and then vary the temporal size between 12 and 24. And for the betas and lattice spacing, we use the scale setting from Francis et al. Here are the results. Here's the just directly from the lattice simulation, non normalized. And then we normalize it with the leading order perturbation theory, and also improve the distance, see the separations between the electric fields by doing a three-level improvement where we match the leading order results of continuum and lattice perturbation theories to redefine the separation. And then we get this curve, curve that is way more readable. And furthermore, if we set this curve in the physical scale and set everything in the same scale, we can see a very nice scaling between all the temperatures. Now, the question then is, of course, what part of this curve is thermal effects, which we can gauge by taking simulations with two different temperatures with a factor of two, but with same lattice spacing, so that we won't have any lattice spacing effects, and dividing them with each other 
and we can see that if there is small separations, there isn't any thermal effects, but then we have thermal effects and large separations. And the thermal effects are larger, the smaller the temperature is. So at very high temperatures, we are here with these electrodes, as expected. Now for the spectral function, like I said, we have the Euclidean correlator that we need to, that we measure, and then we need the spectral function. We actually get the kappa. As a side note, one could also get this coefficient gamma, that is the dispersive counterpart of kappa, but this stuff we focus on the diffusion coefficient. Now for the spectral function, we assume that on the infrared regime, when the temperature is very small, or the omega is quite smaller than the temperature, we have just the simplest possible behavior. It's just the inversion of the definition of the kappa. And then on the UV for the very large omegas, we take the next leading order result from this paper at T0. This form allows us to set the scale so that on UV, we set basically this part to be zero, this choose the scale. So, and then on IR, we use the next leading order, EQCD result. And for the running of the coupling, we use five loop MS bar. And that's what the spectral function looks like. We can see that the next to leading order spectral function replicates the leading order kappa, but that's smaller than the next leading order kappa. Then we see that naive QCD result is divergent. It has log divergence that then has to be HDL resum to get the, the red curve. And then we show one of our models, which is just a step model. We have the infrared behavior up to here, and then we have the UV behavior there. That's the simplest possible model to estimate the spectral function. And on the right, I show some of the other models we have. So we have the step model, and then we have all kinds of these like triangular ansatzes that interpolate with a line between two values of omega. So this goes to omega 0 0.01 and then connects with a line to 2.2 and then follows the UV. And then we just try a bunch of these different models, different values of kappa and compare the lattice study to see what values of kappa are con consistent with the lattice data. Here are the continuum limit of the data. We get pretty smooth continuum limit with the A squared behavior. We use the three finest lattice points for the actual fit, and then we estimate the systematics by including the coarsest point. We also choose to only use the largest spatial size as our continuum limit. We can see that there is no spatial size dependence. So there is the continuum limit in that regime would be the exact same number as the largest level size. So that's why we use that. And these fits are trustworthy when, when the separation is over 0.2. So we focus on that regime, which is also the regime where we know the kappa is, has the biggest effect. And then when we do the continuum limit, the data looks like this. Now we know that below 0.2, we would expect the data to be one. So there is clearly an additional normalization that is needed. This is probably because we are using the leading order perturbation theory result, which is clearly not enough. And that's why we are going to be normalizing everything to one at 0 0.18 or so to get everything on the common curve. And then we can also see that at very high temperatures, the perturbation theory, even at leading order and next leading order, both agree very well with the data, as long as the data is normalized to one. And here is 
then how the extraction is done. So I show the two most different models, the step model and the biggest possible triangle. And we take the lattice data and then divide it with this model. So we integrate over this row with the thermal kernel to get this GE and a low, and then we normalize it to one below 0 0.19. And then we just check if it's consistent with one within the regime between 0 0.19 and 0 0.45. And then we vary kappa and see what values of kappa this is equivalent to one. Which brings us to the results. This was shown yesterday by Peter also. So we can see that at the very small temperatures, we agree very well with all the exceeding results. The Ding et al. uses the current current correlator, so it is the transport peak, and that's why it's probably smaller than the rest of us, but all the multi level results agree well, very well. We also agree very well with the Alice estimate and to a degree with the NLA perturbation theory. And here is the whole range of the data. So we can see that there is a clear temperature dependence. And the next reading order perturbation theory kind of agrees it's a bit low compared to this, that is data. And that's why we tried to fit this. We chose the simplest possible ansatz. So this is just the form of next to leading order kappa. But instead of having the next to leading order coefficient here, we made it a bit parameter. And with this fit, we can then get this blue curve, which agrees pretty well with the data. At very small t, it might be underestimated. A bit, but it's a very nice and simple fit to temperature dependence for the first time. So to conclude, we have measured the cup at very wide range of temperatures. And to the temperature dependence for the first time, we see that the kappa is decreasing when the tau increases and the t increases. And this is similar to the perturbation theory. In future, we plan to measure the gamma, which is the dispersive counterpart. And as discussed by Peter yesterday, there is a lot of development of using the gradient flow to be able to do unquenched measurements. And we have started doing this. There is also these new results by one of the end corrections with the chromomagnetic correlators that we have started looking at. And then, of course, we want to extend to other operators other than kappa later. I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for the talk, for being really more than in time. Uh, let me see. There is Raf that has already a question. Uh, hi, um, so I'm wondering um, about the NLO uh, perturbation theory uh, result. Um, th th this, uh, I mean, this is based on that paper by Caron, Yo, and uh, Guy Moore, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the NLO is already a, a huge correction, almost, you know, factor 10 or more um, to, to the leading order result. So, yeah. so why would one uh, still uh, trust uh, put any trust in that? Because obviously uh, the you know the series is not uh, well behaving, even at NLO already. Well, we don't really put that much trust in it. We are just showing it agrees relatively well with the data. The data is of course not perturbative, and the normalization we use in the UV regime sure comes from the next to leading order result, but that actually agrees with the leading order kappa. The next leading order kappa doesn't have spectral function at the moment. That is known at least. Yeah. Okay, uh, other questions? Just on this point, or the like, I think uh, what Ralph also has in mind that uh, if you compare to next to leading order, it gives the idea that at the end, the final non-perturbative result uh, is not that far from uh, a kind of perturbative calculation. Instead, if you compare with respect to the leading order, 
you are uh, about one order of magnitude uh, smaller. So in that sense, uh, for the way we discuss, um, it could be a little bit misleading. But when you say that um, also the temperature dependence is similar, you discuss that in terms of K over T cube, right? Uh, but that means at the end, uh, the, because uh, in this way, it's, uh, for example, the two pi TDS, the space diffusion coefficient multiplied by t, t, that is what we usually do, rise more or less linearly with T. Is this what, what the TN means? Yeah, it could be that it's just that, but. Uh -huh. Okay, there is Paul. Hey, I have a question. If basically you you, you show the the figure with all the data that are accumulated, if I compare kind of the systematic error bars from one year to the other, it, it seems that they do not really diminish. And then, it's, however, there are some results that are kind of nearly ten years ago. Uh, and then, do we expect in the future, or is it so that basically ten years ago? those error bars, they were kind of too optimistic and, and now they are realistic or what is the situation? Uh, well, the most precise one is the Francis et al. And they used a lot of time to make this one measurement. So that's why they are smaller. And we went for a very wide range of temperature. So that's why we have bigger errors. It's just how you define the use of computation time. What do you want to focus on? The Ding et al. used a different method, so that's why it's lower and the errors are what we underestimated. So, so, so you mean that the computer resources si since five years do not really allow a, a vast increase in the precision? Is, is this a whole message? Yeah, I would say so. We will see what happens with the gradient flow, but... Yeah, okay. if, if uh, I, I may comment, of course. Sure. The errors, I mean, the way we estimate the errors, let's say between Francis et al. and the Bill group and us, is fairly similar. Um, and if you look at the data quality, of course, they have much higher data. So, so therefore, the errors are smaller than ours. So I think what they do is realistic. I mean, uh, Banerjee et al., that's, as you said, it's almost 10 years, so it's nine years ago. And that was the first exploratory study. So they were kind of um, easy with an errors. I mean, it's mostly statistical. They tried to make some systematics. It was, was not as detailed study of the errors as uh, like like uh, the BFL group of hours, and Ding et al. Uh, I mean the errors are small, and uh, and I'm not sure. I mean how how they did analysis. I mean as as I tried to explain yesterday. I mean the method is based on current current correlator, and that is more difficult. So so I would assume, at least from my from what I know about spectral reconstructions, that. Uh, The systematic errors in Ding et al. should be much larger than uh, what you see. And, and I think they don't attempt to really estimate the systematic errors. So that's what they show is, 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 is yeah, I, statistical. Right. I, I can also comment on that. So, so that was on an old study for the Charbonium um, vector meson correlator using uh, the maximum entropy method for the spectral reconstruction. We are currently working on, on updating um, these numbers and I hope that, well, in the next month or so, there will be an update on that, maybe including more realistic um, errors. They are, so the, so the errors here are, are from this MEM analysis, but we are currently uh, using different models to, to estimate also systematic uncertainties. These are just statistical uncertainties of one method, let's say, these green points. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If there are no other questions, uh, we can go to the other talk. I just recall that today um, is uh, essentially devoted to the discussion of how the quark diffusion coefficient is calculated by the different approaches. And the next one is the one from Tamu. Uh, the speaker, I don't know if it will be Ralph. Oh. Yes, I will be uh, speaking in this case and uh, taking a little bit the load off Minhe here. Mm -hmm. uh, my screen is visible. Yes, to me. Okay. 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 
right. So yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, discuss um, the calculation we have done over the last 15 years or so with uh, quite a number of uh, former postdocs and, and students involved uh, at uh, Dex and M to uh, better understand uh, the uh, heavy flavor diffusion coefficient and uh, the associated transport uh, in heavy iron collision. Let me start by just making a couple of uh, general remarks. Um, heavy flavor particles are really uh, an excellent probe of uh, uh, soft medium uh, properties, I would say. Um, that uh, is, for example, for Coconia, uh, the question of binding energies or dissociation rates, or of course in the heavy quark sector, uh, the zero momentum limit of the um, friction coefficient. And indeed, uh, the, the two are uh, uh, related in that uh, they um, um, embedded in the medium, uh, they, they uh, share a, a lot of uh, um, common features uh, through the basic uh, interaction with the QGP. I think it's also fair to say that uh, certainly for the heavy quark diffusion coefficient, non perturbative physics uh, is, uh, is very important. So um, we, we definitely need some guidance uh, from uh, first principles there. And uh, we do have that guidance, in fact, uh, in terms of uh, high precision legislator on various quantities, including uh, the free energy of, of heavy quark there, uh, as shown here as an example. And uh, the idea uh, we then uh, try to pursue is that uh, we make uh, use of these legislators to develop um, a many body theory that uh, is constrained by uh, various types of legislator uh, that can then um, allow us to allow us to deduce the spectral and transfer properties of heavy flavor and ultimately maybe also get insights into the structure of the, of the QGP. So today the focus will be, uh, of course, on um, the uh, heavy flavor uh, transport coefficient. And uh, you, you all know the, um, uh, um, the uh, Fokker-Planck equation that you get from uh, a low momentum expansion of the Boltzmann equation. And it's characterized by two um, uh, transport coefficients, the thermalization rate and the momentum diffusion coefficient, which are, which are in fact uh, related to the Einstein relation. And uh, where the key ingredient is really uh, the scattering matrix element to, for the heavy light scattering uh, in the medium. So, so that is then the quantity that you need to, need to calculate. And uh, let me just say, um, the Fokker-Planck um, is, is not just a reduction of the Boltzmann equation. Uh, uh, you could argue that it, it actually has at least one advantage in that these coefficients can be uh, calculated in, in a full quantum treatment. So you do not need uh, to have a quasi-particle uh, medium for it. You can do these integrations uh, that uh, lead to the transport coefficients in principle over the full spectral functions of the medium without any need for, um, uh, for, for quasi-particle properties. So, so that is a feature that is not uh, easily implemented uh, in a Boltzmann equation. Okay, so let me then um, turn to uh, the way we uh, set up our, uh, our many-body theory thermodynamic key matrix approach. In fact, uh, in, it's uh, technically uh, very similar to, to, to a schwinger dyson equation in the medium. So the Schwinger equation, if you wish, or the scattering equation, key matrix equation, is this uh, lateral summation of an, of an input potential. Um, its leading order um, should, should recover, of course, the perturbative result. But if you have strong coupling, uh, you, have to, you have to resum. That resummation then involves, uh, for one, the potential, of course, that I will have to talk about, and, uh, but also these uh, in-medium propagators of the heavy and light quarks in the medium, which itself are modified in the medium. And, and in fact, uh, um, since, uh, since these uh, self-energies depend on the T-matrix and the T-matrix depends on the self-energies, you, you have a self-consistency problem uh, that, you, that you have to solve. Um, what uh, really comes to uh, uh, the aid here is uh, uh, the, the heavy quark mass in solving this equation because you can, uh, uh, based on the uh, large mass, uh, you, can, you can convince yourself that the energy transfer is suppressed so you're essentially ending up with a momentum transfer and that uh, uh, tremendously simplifies uh, the solution to the lippmann schwinger equation as you can do it or beta side beta equation <coughs> because you can now do a, a 3D reduction and then even do a partial wave expansion and um, essentially end up with a, with a, a one-dimensional scattering equation. 
Now, the, the key input here is the in-medium potential. And this is where, uh, uh, in the first place, uh, we uh, have to go back uh, to the lattice data. And for uh, the early uh, implementations that we, uh, that we uh, implemented, um, we uh, made uh, basically two extreme assumptions uh, on, on what, how the potential is related to the free energy. One is uh, that it is simply the free energy, or the other extreme would be uh, that it would be equal to the uh, internal energy. And in fact, this, uh, this assumption, that is the uh, main ingredient for uh, basically all of the uh, uh, transport results that have been shown over the years. Um, once, uh, once, you, once you make that assumption, you can um, go ahead and solve the lippmann schwinger equation. In fact, uh, you do it in, in all color channels. So not only in the quark under quark, but also uh, quark gluon and quark quark channels. And we also uh, took into account S and P ways um, at that time. One other thing you have to make sure is uh, or worry about is the temperature depends of the quark mass. Um, it was also discussed yesterday by uh, Peter Petrashki. And here, the natural choice is uh, that you take uh, sort of the infinite distance limit uh, of your potential because that corresponds to basically the energy that of two individual quarks or the energy correction, really. And uh, the kind of input we have here is uh, shown here that uh, uh, the quark mass is actually pretty large, close to Tc of order 1.8, and then sort of gradually drops. And from what I saw from Peter's talk yesterday, this is in fact also what uh, um, the latest data seem to uh, suggest. One more uh, thing we have to uh, implement our relativistic corrections for for, um, for finite velocities uh, that, that uh, uh, are in fact needed to make it uh, consistent with the uh, WQCD. QCD. Uh, and then there's, of course, the question about the, the bulk medium. And uh, for the current implementations, uh, we uh, essentially assumed uh, a quasi-particle uh, medium where the thermal masses of the quarks and gluons are essentially given by GT and uh, also include some small uh, widths with, which are however, not very uh, relevant as they are uh, safely smaller uh, than the quasi particle mass, which are typically 500, 600 MeV or so at low, uh, relatively low temperatures. Um, once you have this in place, you can uh, calculate a, a wide variety, variety of things. You can in particular calculate the Quarkonium T matrix and see, uh, uh, and, and from that, the uh, quarkonium correlators compare them to lattice. So that is one constraint here. It's not perfect, but I think it's pretty reasonable for the purposes. We also calculated susceptibilities, um, which tell you about the uh, excitations that you have in the medium. Here's a bunch of lines that are simply uh, the non interacting gas results with the varying masses from, from one GV charm quark mass down to two, just for basically to guide the eye, there are lattice data in there. These are these symbols. And then uh, there are the results that we get from our uh, T-matrix approach using either the U or uh, uh, free energy as a potential. And uh, they essentially uh, consistent uh, with, uh, with the lattice data here. Okay, with, uh, with that, then we can look at some results relevant for um, heavy flavor transport, namely the, the heavy light or charm quark, light quark, my partner really uh, scattering amplitudes. And indeed, um, what you find is that uh, at high temperatures, uh, the, this uh, imaginary part of the image is essentially structureless. But then as you, as you uh, go up uh, in, as you go down in, in temperature, um, you, you find that, uh, that uh, indeed uh, bound sets or actually flash part resonance is right at the threshold. Uh, build up, and uh, these, of course, lead to, to a very large increase in the in the scattering strength uh, of the heavy and, and the uh, quarks on the light uh, surrounding uh, thermal uh, partons. And and in a way, it's inevitable because uh, when you go to zero temperature, you should recover um, uh, the, these uh, demeson bound sets, and and you do. Uh, that is shown here by uh, the the solid line in the in the limit of zero temperature. We do get the the right beam is on mass. Essentially, we don't have the spin, uh, the spin, spin splitting in here, so we are close to the D star, really. Uh, but but this is sort of uh, how this uh, approach is also rooted in the in the vacuum spectroscopy. Um, what you also see that uh, there there are uh, weaker but still uh, resonance correlations building up in uh, the in the dichroic, the color triplet, sorry, anti-triplet channel, which is in fact a building block of uh, of uh, charm variants. 
So, so the main uh, feature here is that we do get this enhanced uh, relaxation rate uh, near TC because of the resonance interaction strength. And at the same time, also these resonances uh, provide sort of a, a pathway for, for recombination um, uh, uh, to convert the system into, into hadrons. So then let's have a look at the relaxation rate. Uh, this is shown here on the left. Um, these are pretty uh, large values. I haven't put it here, but it's about a factor seven or eight larger uh, than perturbative UCD. And uh, the temperature dependence is relatively weak, at, uh, especially at, at low temperatures. And uh, that you can plot then also as a function of temperature at uh, zero momentum, which is uh, the uh, spatial diffusion efficient. And this is uh, here uh, the red line. Uh, and uh, uh, you see a hint of a quadratic uh, uh, behavior, and that would really mean that uh, A is constant. If A were constant with temperature, it would be quadratic. So there's a hint here, and then it levels off and gives ultimately way to, to dependence, which is closer uh, to DQCD. But again, uh, the um, reduction compared to uh, perturbative uh, calculations leading order is very large. And what we also see is that uh, uh, using the free energy as a potential um, makes you you basically lose a factor three in interaction strength. Still, uh, from the phenology of the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, with this approach, we're still missing uh, some strength. Um, and um, that uh, is something we still need to implement. Uh, we also have not uh, implemented yet in the phenology the radiative energy loss, uh, but there will be a talk uh, by Shua Lu on uh, Thursday on, on how we can also calculate that uh, from, from the median uh, T matrix. So um, let me just spend one minute or two minutes on more recent developments where we actually not make an assumption on the potential, but try to calculate it um, by uh, in fact calculating the free energy from the approach and, and then trying to find the potential that uh, is consistent with the free energy. So, so this is really what you would like to do if you um, have a, a calculation of the free energy uh, and the internal energy rather than um, assuming it as a potential and maybe not surprising the uh, potential so, sort of slots in between the U and the F potential, U and F uh, limits. Um, in fact, the, the solution is not unique. You can find a strongly interacting and also weakly interacting. And the key difference is that the widths here are very different. In the strongly interacting case, you have very large widths and uh, those are the ones that actually drive you away from the free energy. But you also find a weakly coupled solution where the widths are small and the potential is actually close to the free energy. Uh, and what turns out is that indeed these long range remnants of the confining force in this strongly uh, uh, coupled solution are quite important uh, for the heavy flavor transport. Uh, and just as a, uh, as a last slide before the conclusion, I show you some results here um, comparing to our uh, U potential results. What you see here in particular in the V2, you do lose quite a bit of strength uh, at, uh, at, small, at large momenta, which means um, short distances in the that the U potential, which is a kind of extreme at intermediate distances, but you do get actually a little bit of an enhancement, 20% or so um, at, uh, at long distances or small momenta, precisely because of these long range uh, remnants of the confining force. But you also see very clearly here that the free energy really uh, can, can do the, the job. And uh, with that, um, I'm uh, basically, oh, I'm all right in time, I guess, um, coming to my summary. So we have uh, tried to develop a, a quantum many body uh, approach that uh, allows us to connect uh, open and heavy, open and hidden uh, quark properties, but also make a connection to the QGP. We have uh, constrained uh, uh, our information as much as we can by lattice data, and uh, the approach also is rooted in principle in vacuum spectroscopy that uh, you can uh, also systematically improve by including spin-spin or spin-orbit splittings. And in this way, uh, we can encompass or, or calculate actually bulk spectral and transport properties uh, within the same uh, uh, framework. And the main finding at this point is that indeed the remnants of the confining force uh, are, are the key uh, player for, uh, for uh, the physics of the strongly coupled QGP really. Um, it provides resonance interaction strength. It uh, leads to the dynamical formation of uh, hadron, uh, hadronic and diquark uh, resonances uh, that, uh, that uh, in fact, also leads to a transition uh, in the degrees of freedom. Um, the, the quark uh, um, widths become very large, so they are kind of um, smeared out uh, of, of the spe spectrum while the uh, um, Masonic and uh, diquark degrees of freedom take over. 
In this way, we have a pathway really to recombination here. We still have some missing strength uh, in the heavy quark diffusion coefficient. Um, and uh, this is something we're still trying to investigate whether there could be other sources uh, in this approach to, to, to find that missing strength. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> Thank you, Ralph. We're really in time. Uh, there are questions. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes, please. So uh, we calculate the heavy quark diffusion coefficient on the lattice in a large uh, window of temperature from very large temperature to very small temperature. Could you use it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we would be very much uh, delighted to to compare our uh, you know results in, uh, to, to to what we find here. So yes. Uh, what but, we find is published, uh, so, but, but yes. uh, so we should put it in here. But, but what, uh, that was that was, I guess, the que your question was actually a maybe a different one. So you you calculating in quenched uh, approximation? Yeah, right, uh, in quenched. Yeah. So 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 that that is indeed uh, one thing we could check. We could switch off the quarks and uh, the quark degrees of freedom and see what we get for gluon plasma. Uh, that, that's indeed uh, what we. Uh, uh, should do. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but yeah, because for quenched, you know, you can easily uh, implement quenched in this uh, approach, and, and uh, then uh, let us data even much better still, right? For several. Yeah. Uh, moreover, uh, we we got uh, so we got the kappa for uh, in a large window of temperature, but we also extract the kappa from unquenched lattice data in a small in, uh, window of temperature, and uh, the two things are not so much different. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the small uh, around TC, okay, no, uh, not around TC in a small window of temperature, yeah. So you could look at both because uh, one determination is unquenched because it's coming from unquenched lattice data on the mass of uh, the quarkonia and the mass and the width of the quarkonia. And we are okay, very good. Yes, yeah, thank yeah. you. And uh, yeah, I also I also wonder if you can use this uh, calculation of the kappa even if in quenched really as an input uh, more than. Uh, to compare the end, since it is a quantity that is calculated and non-perturbatively, if you can insert it uh, inside your theory, since it has a field theoretical uh, description and uh, definition. Yeah, the, the, the issue here is uh, that uh, we, we, of course, need the momentum dependence. We heavily rely on the momentum dependence uh, of, of the transport coefficient. And uh, that is not so easy to get uh, from, from the lattice. So, uh, this is so one of the main dependence. So you mean because we are calculating it in the limit of infinite mass. So this is the first term. So yeah. So so here on the left of the panel, for example, you see the momentum dependence, and we discussed it yesterday already. I mean that that is an important ingredient into phenological calculations, and uh, we uh, you know uh, it would be great if we could get some constraints on that. Um, I don't think we can get easily a lattice calculation which has the precision and the the breadth uh, of what we need in phenology, um, but uh, 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 I think really uh, constraints it's on- an expansion, It's an expansion in one over n, so one would expect that the correction is smaller. And now there is a, the first correction term would be a magnetic contribution, but would be very much suppressed. Uh, anyway, we are trying to calculate it, uh, but uh, uh, I would be surprised if it would be big. So, there should not be so much difference between the static limit because it's an expansion. Okay, charm is smaller. I'm uh, more speaking sure. about bottomonium. Sure. Charm mass is smaller, there may be si more sizable. Yeah, but not really big size. But um, on this, size. Nora, we have tried a little bit just with the simple pre QCD or with quasi particle models, just to see if you change only the mass and you keep. Uh, the rest of the scattering matrix, the simple leading order scattering matrix, you get already between charm and bottom 25-30% of difference. Of yeah, course. well, I mean, of course, for charm, it's less suppressed. So a one on a square correction for charm is, mm. is uh, yeah, that's right. And for bottom, it's much suppressed. You are comparing a five to one, and, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. OK. Other questions? Well, um, maybe a comment. Of course, the issue is here how you define the Langevin dynamics. Uh, in principle, if you try to do a strict one over M expansion, I mean, the leading order 
you get kappa, which is independent of the momentum. You go to next two reading order, so one or M correction included. There is also no, no momentum dependence. So somehow, at least in this counting one over M up to the order uh, has been calculated, there is no, no dependence momentum. So you have two parameters, yeah. kappa E, kappa B, and that's it. Now, beyond that, nobody knows. But but what we're calculating on that is in a sense is is one of m expansion, and uh, and uh, and and that by definition we don't have momentum dependence. Yeah, they are relativistic correlation, but not an explicit momentum dependence. Yeah, because if you do that in effective field theory, is that you have the static limit and going to infinity, and then one over m is there actually there are one on a square suppressed terms. Right, right, but not really depends on uh, on p. But uh, you can a uh, relativistic correction may be mimicked uh, with a p-dependent field. Probably, if you put everything together, you can mimic it in that way. Yeah, but that probably would be even higher order. No, I mean in phenomenology, you can mimic uh, one over m uh, giving some some dependence in p. Well, it's probably you mimic one over m squared effect. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 because it is one square effect, right, right. You can do that. To try to do that, I think for us is anyway useful if you if you can in the future. Okay, so let's uh, go to the next talk. Um, that is the one from LBNL. The speaker will be I don't know if it is uh, Xinyan or or Shanshan Shanshan. Hello, this is Shanshan. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, you can okay, see. You. you can just start. Okay, uh, thanks for the kind invitation. So today uh, I'd like to discuss the heavy quark diffusion in the linear Boltzmann transport model that's developed at uh, CCNU and uh, Berkeley. So today I will concentrate on the diffusion part or the elastic scattering part. Uh, so uh, we will use uh, construct a Boltzmann transport model to describe the uh, evolution of the phase space distribution uh, of heavy quark. So here one denote uh, the heavy quark. So this is the Boltzmann uh, equation uh, describing heavy quark evolution. On the right hand side, one can see the collision term, which is uh, the subtraction between a gain term minus a loss term in which the WPK is defined as the transition rate from the momentum state P1 to P1 minus K. So the first term is a transition from some other state to the states that we are discussing. And the second term is the uh, transition from the current state to some other state. So if we concentrate on the last term, then we can uh, directly connect this transition rate with a microscopic cross section, and which can be further calculated using the perturbative QCD matrix elements. And uh, then here, if we uh, integrate this momentum transfer K over the scattering rate, uh, uh, over the transition rates, then uh, we obtain what we uh, define as the scattering rate, which means uh, the number of scattering per unit time. And this is the full expression connecting the scattering rate with the matrix element in perturbative calculation. And here, uh, the S2 function is defined in this way, which gives us the kinematic cut. So it is necessary for a uh, light parton scattering with the QGP medium to avoid possible uh, divergence in the T-channel scattering. But for heavy quark, since heavy quark already have a very large mass, then this uh, is probably not necessary. So we can uh, expand uh, the extent the scattering rate to a more general form to define the average value of um, any given uh, quantity in this way. For example, if here uh, we define x as uh, as one, then we obtain uh, the scattering rate back. But if we define the x function as e y minus e three, that is the initial energy minus the final energy of the heavy quark then we get the energy loss uh, per unit time, which is defined as the E hat in the J language or the uh, drag coefficient in the heavy quark language. Similarly, if we uh, define the X as the momentum uh, transverse momentum broadening, 
of the uh, of the jet pattern or heavy quark here, then we get what we know as the Q hat parameter or the transverse diffusion coefficient for the heavy quark. Now let me discuss uh, how we connect uh, the the Boltzmann transport the, the rate in the Boltzmann transport equation to the bulk medium that we have. So in the rate calculation, we we need to know the uh, Parton distribution inside the QGP medium, like the, this F2, F3, F4 function. So for the bulk matter uh, in the LBT study, we uh, use the CLVs, hydrodynamic simulations, which is developed uh, also at the CCNU and Berkeley, which is a three plus one dimensional viscous hydrodynamic model that is uh, combined with the uh, GPU parallelization to speed up the uh, simulation. And this uh, CLVs hydrodynamic model provide us the local flow velocity and also the temperature of the QGP medium. And uh, these two terms enter the rate calculation for the Boltzmann transport. For example, if we know the flow velocity, then we can boost the heavy quark into the local rest frame of the medium and then solve the Boltzmann equation there in the local rest frame. And meanwhile, if we know the temperature, then uh, it determines the momentum distribution of the thermal patterns inside the medium. For example, with the knowledge of the temperature, we can use the uh, both Einstein distribution to sample the gluon distribution and use the Fermi Dirac distribution to sample the thermal light quark distribution inside the QGP medium, and then let them scatter with the uh, heavy quark that uh, under discussion. For uh, current uh, public uh, publication for LBT in the market, uh, currently we, uh, we use the massless thermal patterns. That is, we uh, assume the thermal mass, uh, uh, we, we assume the thermal patterns are massless, they have zero mass. Uh, with this assumption, uh, we, we est overestimate the density of the thermal patterns inside the medium and also overestimate the scattering uh, strength. So in the end, when we describe the data, that, that we underestimate the effective alpha s in the uh, perturbative scattering. But this will be fixed uh, later in the uh, in the end of my talk by introducing the thermal mass into this uh, uh, Boltzmann transport. Uh, now uh, with this setup, uh, this is how we implement the numerical simulation in a Monte Carlo way. So we first calculate the scattering rate of all possible scattering channels. For heavy quark, it's easy. It's just a heavy quark scattering with gluon or light quark. And then uh, we add all possible uh, channel uh, together and get this total scattering rate. And then if we uh, times it with the delta T, which is the time step in the numerical simulation, then we get the scattering probability uh, during this time step. And then we use this probability to do Monte Carlo simulation to determine whether uh, the elastic scattering happen inside this time step or not. If it happens, then we go back to the, uh, to the rate of each channel and using this branching ratio to decide uh, through which channel this heavy quark scatter. Does it scatter with the gluon or does it scatter with a U, D, or S quark? Uh, then with the channel decided, but we go back to the differential scattering rate to, uh, to sample the uh, momentum space of the two outgoing patterns. And in this way, we, we can uh, complete one uh, two, two, two scattering. And on the right-hand side, we did an uh, academic check of how the simulation works. So here, uh, we, we not only check for heavy quark C and B, also check for gluon and the light quark scattering inside the QGP. So on the uh, right, uh, on the x-axis, we uh, present the time evolution, and on the right, uh, y-axis, we present the average energy loss as a function of time. And uh, here, uh, the open symbols uh, are from the Monte Carlo simulation, and the uh, curves represent the semi-analytical calculation uh, or the e-head calculation shown earlier. And then compare them together, we see that uh, we, we think a brick medium with a fixed temperature, uh, our Monte Carlo simulation can uh, agree with the semi-analytical result pretty well. And then we can uh, 
apply this Monte Carlo simulation in a more dynamic medium where the semi-analytical solution is hard to obtain. Uh, okay, uh, so that's the uh, numerical setup. Uh, now let me uh, move on to how we calculate the transport coefficient. So as I mentioned earlier, if uh, we only concentrate on the elastic part, then the transport coefficient can be evaluated in this way, like the scattering rate, the drag, and also the transverse diffusion. However, uh, in LBT model, we not only uh, take into account of the elastic scattering, but also consider the, uh, the inelastic scattering or medium-induced gluon bram stratum process. So uh, the total energy loss should combine them together. And uh, the, the in inelastic process will be discussed separately on Thursday uh, by Guang Yu, Qing. But here, I just want to uh, note that uh, the inelastic part, the scattering rate, the energy loss rate, and the Q hat broadening rate, uh, actually, the inelastic part is time dependent. Or in, uh, in another word, it depends on the path length of the heavy clock. So we cannot just uh, simply calculate uh, one number for this coefficient. So to, but, but to fulfill the homework assignment of this workshop, what we can do is to uh, kind of extract an effective drag or transverse diffusion coefficient via a brick uh, over uh, an appropriate length, say uh, three Fermi. So what we provide for this workshop is we turn on both the elastic and inelastic processes, and we let a heavy clock to start with the uh, momentum in the Z direction and let it uh, like to uh, evolve through a brick medium with the fixed temperature with three Fermi lengths. And then uh, in the end, we, calcul we calculate its final momentum. So then the drag coefficient that takes into account both of the elastic and inelastic contribution is defined in this way. That is the initial PZ minus the final PZ divided by the, uh, the length. So uh, if you want to scale it with the momentum, then you divide it with the P PZ initial. So then uh, uh, it is consistent with uh, what other people provide to this homework. And uh, for the transverse momentum, we, uh, we calculate the final uh, P per or P transverse and then divide by L. And that is what we provide for this transverse momentum diffusion coefficient. Uh, minutes. Yes? Five minutes. OK, OK, thank you. OK, so uh, that's our setup uh, of the uh, elastic scattering and also transport coefficient in, in the LBT model. As I mentioned earlier, uh, one caveat of the current LBT model is that we assume zero mass for the thermal pattern in the medium, uh, which uh, may have some effect uh, on, on, the, on fitting the equation of state. So this is what we uh, have uh, done in progress for an improvement. So we upgrade the LBT model into what we call the QLBT model, where Q uh, represents the quasi-particle uh, quasi model. So here we assign the thermal mass, like UDGS, in this way, where the one parameter is the G, the coupling strength. With the, the thermal mass and the coupling strength, one can calculate the pressure of the medium and also other thermal dynamic quantity like the energy density and also the entropy density. And then uh, the, uh, again, uh, the parameter is the G, the coupling strength here. So we parameterize this G with four parameter and then fit this uh, uh, S, uh, S as a function of T to the lattice data and extract this parameter that we assume in the G factor. And in the end, we can uh, obtain coupling strength as a function of T and also the thermal mass as a function of T uh, for, for different lattice data. So for different set of lattice data, we will get different uh, distribution. And then we put this uh, massive light clock into, uh, back into LBT and then calculate the heavy clock scattering with the medium. And for heavy clock scattering, uh, uh, as shown by this diagram, there are two coupling uh, vertices. One is the GT, which is the coupling inside the medium. This is exactly what we extract from the lattice. But another coupling vertex is uh, the heavy clock coupling with the medium, which, which we assume also depends on the heavy clock energy. So here we do another ansatz to uh, parameterize this uh, alpha s. 
And then we can calibrate this QLBT model uh, with the experimental data of the heavy clock RA and V2, and uh, which gives a reasonable description of the data. And uh, comparing to uh, the massless version of the LBT model, the value we get for this alpha S of, the, of this uh, vertex is somewhat larger, which is understandable because now we have the massive pattern, we have less density, and then we need a stronger alpha S to keep the similar interaction strength to describe the experimental data. So uh, our current result was, uh, was posted in this PubMed poster, but a, a full manuscript uh, is under preparation and will be released soon. And in the end, we also uh, present the Q hat as a function of T and also the DS, the diffusion coefficient as a function of T extracted from this uh, QLBT model. The Q hat is consistent with the jet collaboration extraction and, the, uh, and this two band of the uh, DS coefficient seems also lie within the uh, band that's a, a great uh, between most people in this, uh, in, in this field. So that's the end of my talk, thank you. Thank you, Shenshan, for your nice talk. Uh, let me say at the end, this is becoming for the elastic part much more close to what Tinkadania have been doing essentially. It's yes, uh, yes. Uh, here, there is a question from Elena. Okay, first of all, Shanshan, thank you for the nice talk. And I see that you are also coming to quasi particle description, and which is, a, as you know, that's what we are doing. But what I yes. see, you decided to stay with one PI approach. So it means still you don't implement a spectral function and the widths uh, for your uh, quasi particle model. In this respect, I have a question Did you try to calculate transport coefficients with your uh, quasi particles? Will you describe? Peter OS and other things? Uh, that's we, we are not there yet, but that's a good suggestion we will keep in mind. Yeah, because uh, you mm -hmm. see that is uh, one of the good, uh, let's say, motivation in order to do that. Uh, that's point like uh, quasi particles, I mean, um, with uh, some uh, temperature dependent mass uh, would be not sufficient uh, to describe the full strength of this interaction. Uh, but okay, so that uh, was our solution. So as you know, we have a, a two PI approach and the spectral function with that. That's what I saw. We'll talk. But thank you very much. Very interesting. Yeah, that's that's a good suggestion. But uh, uh, maybe I I, I can uh, make a note that uh, uh, actually our quasi particle model is kind of in between of the our original model and your full quasi particle scattering. So here, what we do is still heavy quark scattering with the QGP. But yes. uh, when we sample QGP into quasi particle, we introduce some mass effect or uh, GT effect. So it's not a uh, compared to your full quasi particle model, it's still kind of somewhere in between. Just want to make a notice on that. Okay, thank so, you. Very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, however, let me comment that at the end, Elena, what we get at the level of transport coefficients with this kind of approach is at the end very similar uh, to what you get because the effect of the width that are, uh, for example, in PHSD of the quasi-particle model is not so large to change uh, in, a, in a significant way the transport coefficients. At the end, this is much closer to PHSD uh, than, of course, the previous one, but really quite close. Are there any questions in this approach? Paul? Uh, uh, maybe I just have a comment here. The I mean, here, the quartz particle is used to calculate transport coefficients for heavy quark. And uh, to extend that to calculate the bulk, I mean, the shear viscosity, which is essentially for the bulk medium of light quark and glue. And there is a, another set of assumptions you have to do. Sure, that, that is true, Xinyan. But at the end, we have done, and uh, I mean, I think if Helena, if we look at the paper, you get anyway quite quite closer. Of course, uh, um, I mean uh, the the fact that you neglect the width uh, for the charm quarks uh, is less important than for light quarks. That, that for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, can I 
comment very shortly. Uh, so, of course, our goal is also to describe not only the, um, let's say, heavy quark and hard probes, but also the bulk dynamics. And then uh, having a um, spectral function would allow you also to have not only time-like, but space-like part, which you can relate to the potential and- No, 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 that, this is okay. Okay, so, okay it just, sure, just sure. comment why also it's motivation to do that. Okay, thank you. I'm PhD. It is usable for many other things, including also the subthreshold production that you cannot describe otherwise. Yeah, yeah. and also, and also, they, you know, the purpose of LBT is to 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 simulate uh, jet propagation, even for even for light quarks. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think I don't know whether this spect function is. Uh, a significant impact for very energetic uh, uh, pattern propagation uh, inside the medium. I mean, for the bulk, I definitely agree. But for that, we simply used viscous hydro, and that automatically taking account to uh, you know the viscosity there. So, uh, I, but, I, I mean, unless unless you want to describe both bulk. And the hard prop, prop, you know, transport within the same framework. Of course, you need you need to do that. But within LBT, I'm not quite sure uh, that you really have to do that. Yeah, I'm uh, fully I agree with you. Agree. Yes, if I just can comment, and actually, your result, what Shan Shan showed for uh, jet uh, transport coefficient for Q hat and so on, is very similar to what we recently obtained. Really, so. Yeah, this one, Q hat over T in the power mm -hmm. three. Yeah. yeah, looks very, very similar in our case also. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one last question for, from Paul. Yeah, Shan Shan, could you come yes. back to this alpha S of E? That you had on the one? next one? Yeah, uh, and I, I see that it seems to be strongly in, increasing at low en energy. So here you're really plotting down to the heavy quark mass for the energy? Or, or is uh, it still? Yes, but, but I think that there will be cut. Like if it runs to uh, 0.5 or, or around that, then, then we will not let it blow up. There, there will be some cut. And, and then what, what, what are the uncertainties that comes from this cut when you evaluate the DS, which is in principle a, a zero? Uh, an, an energy component of the model. Uh, I need to double check that. Yeah, so it's this is preliminary result. It's not uh, final yet. Just, just, to know the control that, yeah. just to know the control that you have on, on, on these ideas from reference. Thank, yes. Thanks a lot, Chan Chan. Very nice. Mm -hmm. talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can move to the next talk that is uh, from Nantes. Uh, I don't know if is uh, is Marlene is. I'm yes, here. I'm here, so you can share the screen. I will do that. OK, thank you. We see it. Uh, we can start. OK, thank you very much. I'm basically uh, showing you the same presentation which I prepared for uh, last year except that I put up the, the logo here. So let's start the, the collisional energy loss uh, scenario as implemented in uh, the Nantes model for heavy quark uh, transport coupled to the medium. So after some general aspects, I will introduce the one gluon exchange model that we are using containing an effective running coupling and a self-consistently determined device screening mass uh, the motivation of uh, this model, as was introduced by Paul, Paul in, in these two uh, papers and used in our subsequent uh, calculations for heavy quark uh, observables, the motivation is that even a fast parton uh, with large momentum can undergo collisions with moderate momentum, exchange and a large alpha s of uh, q squared. For the collisional energy loss, of course, the, the leading order Feynman diagram, diagrams are, are given here. The dominant contribution comes from, from the T-channel, where the well-known infrared singularity needs to be uh, regulated by a screening mass 
So the gluon propagator, one over T becomes one over T minus the screening mass squared. And mu is often taken as the thermal gluon mass. So it's of the order of the device screening mass, which is of the order of G times a T. And the cross section, as we all know, uh, very well, very much depends, very strongly depends on this choice of a regulator. Um, when we use the HTL, the hard thermal loop, for some gluon propagator for a small momentum exchange and the bare gluon propagator for a large momentum exchange, one can calculate the energy loss in this uh, PQCD motivated approach. There is the separation um, between the hard thermal loop contribution at t below T star and the bare gluon propagator at, uh, at large momentum transfer uh, larger than T star. And uh, in QED, for example, these are well separated uh, scales and the energy loss then becomes independent of this intermediate uh, scale uh, T star which is not the case at the relevant uh, temperatures that we are interested in for, for RIG and LHC experiments, then the energy loss calculated in this HTL plus hard approach um, is dependent only for values that are beyond the validity of uh, HTL itself. So the idea underlying this uh, NOND model for collisional energy loss is uh, to write uh, the gluon propagator uh, as given here, the reduced infrared regulator lambda times the Debye mass squared into the hard part. So this gives an HTL plus semi-hard uh, approach. And then this lambda is tuned such that we achieve a maximal independence uh, from this intermediate scale, a T star that separates the HTL from the semi-hard uh, part. And this is uh, done here in Paul's plot where we look at the energy loss as a function of uh, this uh, choice of uh, T star. So we want this to be uh, a, a, straight, uh, a, a straight line, a constant, so that it's independent of T star. And uh, from this approach, one can deduce an optimal uh, lambda in the semi-hard part, which is a point uh, one, one. And now this is uh, a rather complicated uh, gluon propagator to uh, to use the same energy loss uh, can uh, effectively be obtained in the Born PQCD approach where we use a simpler uh, propagator where we have the device screening mass determined, uh, determined self consistently at a given temperature. Come to this uh, on, on the next slides. And then uh, we don't have the lambda anymore, but the kappa parameter, which in this setup then turns out to be a zero point. Uh, two, and then the energy loss uh, as a function of this kappa, which should be the same as before, uh, effectively gives the value of, of kappa as uh, is determined here. So this is a two-stage process. First, um, this is sometimes confusing. First, the optimal lambda is uh, obtained from requiring this maximal independence from the intermediate scale T star which should not enter into the final results. And then in the second step, uh, we use this uh, simpler propagator in the effective Born PQCD approach, such that we obtain the same energy loss as before. And this gives this uh, kappa parameter here in the, uh, in the regulator. Um, now in these calculations, we use an effective uh, a strong coupling, as is shown here in the time-like and in the space-like uh, regimes. Um, this uh, is obtained from uh, universality constraints as um, in these described in these papers by Yuri Dokshitzer. It is uh, infrared safe, so the Q squared close to zero uh, momentum transfer does not contribute uh, to the energy loss, and it gives uh, rather large values for intermediate momentum transfer, leading, of course, to a uh, larger cross section. So this is one ingredient that is used in, uh, in, in, in this approach uh, in the one to one exchange model. So this is the ingredient for, for alpha s as a function of the momentum uh, transfer. 
And then we have, uh, as I said before, the self-consistently uh, calculated device screening mass. So the device screening mass is calculated at the scale of the device screening mass um, itself. And uh, if one includes uh, the running coupling and a self-consistently determined device screening mass into the leading order PQCD energy loss uh, calculation, then the energy loss does not depend uh, logarithmically on uh, on the, on, the, on the energy anymore as it, as it does here, but it leads to uh, this behavior here for large energies that it depends on alpha S uh, squared times T uh, squared. So this logarithmic dependence uh, vanishes in, this, in these calculations as were the calculations by Pichier and um, uh, Stefan Pigny. If we use uh, this self-consistently determined device screening mass as uh, used in, in, in these uh, PQCD uh, calculations, it is of this form. So as I said, the device screening mass depends on, on, the, on the scale of the device screening mass itself. We can compare then these full calculations to the PQCD uh, calculations mentioned here uh, above, and the result is uh, shown here. So the energy loss as a function of the momentum of the heavy quark for different temperatures is, uh, is shown here with the dark intervals. As you see here, these are the PQCD calculations with the running coupling and the self-consistently determined device screening mass. The light intervals, these are the calculations from the one gluon, the non one gluon exchange model with the, the solid line here. Um, so it's bounded by values of, of this lambda parameter, uh, one between one and the optimal one here on, on the top, which is the, the solid uh, dark line. And on top here, you have the, the fixed coupling PQCD calculations, which are the dashed lines. So we see that this approach is uh, consistent with uh, the PQCD calculations uh, from these papers in the range of validity, so high temperature and high uh, momentum of, of the heavy quarks. But you see in, in the range uh, where we are more interested in, so temperatures for about the 500 uh, MeV, uh, there are th these intervals are still uh, overlapping, but uh, there are some uh, some differences with our optimal uh, prescription. So the energy loss is more pronounced in our optimal description than in these uh, PQCD calculations. Um, now, if we look at the, at the track coefficient in in this model. Then we see that the infrared uh, regulator with this value for the parameter kappa leads to an increase of the track coefficient by a factor of two. So this is here the, the solid red line versus uh, the, the dashed curve in, in this plot here of the track coefficient as a function of the heavy quark momentum. And um, the replacement uh, of this of, of the full gluon propagator uh, with the Debye mass that depends on temperature and uh, the, the explicit momentum transfer by the more simpler uh, gluon propagator with the uh, self-consistently determined Debye mass give very uh, similar results as we can see here in, in, in these two plots uh, comparing the, the solid red line, which is the final result with the dashed purple line that is using uh, this more uh, complicated uh, gluon, the slightly more complicated gluon propagator. So this is reassuring that uh, using this somewhat simpler gluon propagator in the one exchange gluon model is um, is a good choice to do. Uh, five minutes, Marlene. Yes, very good. Now I'm uh, just coming to to some properties and and some uh, results. So coupling this uh, collisional energy loss uh, scenario to the EPOS2 uh, fluid dynamical uh, expansion. And then uh, we see in order to reproduce the results uh, from, from Alice for the d meson RA at intermediate uh, PT, we need to include an overall uh, K factor that multiplies the, the interaction rate, which in case of the purely collisional energy loss, that's the one I'm only talking about here, uh, is a factor of uh, 1.5. So we increase the interaction rate by this factor 1.5. And comparing to uh, the calculations that include uh, nuclear shadowing effects, we see uh, a rather good 
uh, description of the of the LSD meson data and uh, also somewhat of the of the RA measured in the star experiment although here we have this this overshooting that uh, can for example come from uh, hadronization effects it also works well uh, for for the v2 if we look at, at this again only please look at the orange curve that is the uh, collisional energy loss scenario and uh, for Rick, we, we show for two different K factors, of course, a larger K factor increases the V2 in this range. We had some predictions for the V3, the triangular uh, flow as, as well, giving finite uh, contributions to, to the, uh, the initial state that comes from the EPOS model and is injected to the fluid dynamics. Um, we can look at some further properties uh, of the interaction. For example, we can look at uh, the, um, the the transverse momentum distribution in a single uh, scattering, where we see when we later include the radiative contributions, we get uh, a larger average uh, momentum broadening, a transverse momentum broadening for 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 a single scattering. If we include this, if we convolute this with the evolution in the medium, however, we see that uh, the PT distribution after the evolution in the medium gives a larger average PT broadening for the purely collisional uh, energy loss, uh, which is, is explicitly shown here. That's the average perpendicular uh, broadening of uh, the heavy quarks in the medium which is larger for the collisional energy loss and of course larger at higher temperature than at lower temperature. And from this, uh, we can expect that, for example, initial correlations that we also looked at will be broadened more effectively in this uh, collisional interaction mechanism that I described in the beginning of this talk. And indeed, if we look at these azimuthal correlations here of uh, uh, charm, anti-charm, pairs that are initially correlated back to back, we see a more efficient uh, broadening in this collisional energy loss scenario. In particular, at, at lower um, momenta, the initial back to back correlation, so that would peak at pi are completely washed out and we see more the radial flow uh, of, of the medium, which, uh, is, uh, this, which distinguishes this collisional uh, model that I was uh, presenting, for example, from including radiative uh, corrections. So finally, uh, to compare the diffusion coefficient um, that one obtains in our collisional approach with this K factor of 1.5 uh, to the lattice data uh, and to uh, the Bayesian analysis results uh, from this paper, uh, we see that we are here on the, on the rather uh, low side of, of all the uh, available um, calculations, but uh, within this uncertainty band of the Bayesian analysis and close uh, to these lattice data here and not too far from uh, the other existing uh, lattice calculations. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, are there questions Just maybe, maybe I can have a uh, just um, sh very short one the if you go back to your uh, the quark the two I mean the kiku bar oh, yeah this one when you increase no no the next no the Sorry, correlation this one, yes as, you, the, as music angle yes yes this one it's interesting when you increase your, in the central collision, when you increase your kappa to a very big value, um, the collective flow really, really is strong so that your CC bar is, uh, uh, has sort of like a radio flow together, looks mm -hmm. like. So that's why you have a peak of, yes. um, of the same, in, you know, the one, Right, zero, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, at zero. So this is basically this uh, platonic wind effect, as it as it was called. 
So when you have this initial back-to-back -back, uh, correlation, and then we have a strong interaction with the medium that, that has some flow in this direction, of course, these two initially back-to-back -back correlated pairs will be pushed uh, into the same into the same direction. So we end up not with the initial correlations that peak at pi, but we end up with an opening angle of, of, of close to zero of these uh, of these pairs, which here only happens in the collisional interaction uh, mechanism. Yeah, yeah. But the, for this, I mean, this of course is only at a low PT, but for those low PT, uh, I'm not quite even sure that even the initial correlation is that yes. strongly picked uh, back to back. It's probably there's very broad. Uh, yeah. Yes, that, uh, that, that is probably true. So yes, if we use a more realistic uh, initial conditions, well, that exist uh, in these uh, event by event generators like, like Hervik or um, MC at NLO calculations, that exists for the for the BB bar, then already we see a rather broad, um, a rather broad initial uh, correlations, if not yes. washed out out completely. Yes. Pre -pre precise, precisely, Xinyan. If, if if you read uh, the, the the paper, I mean, what we mentioned is that we we'll need to go at this intermediate PT regime in order to have a chance, uh, basically, to see those ex extra. Uh, effects from the plasma because at too low PT, I mean, correlations do not exist or they will be washed away. And at large momentum, what happens is that you are dominated by the initial Bremsstrahl. So basically, you need to go this intermediate PT. Yeah, yeah. Another question from Mina. Uh, hello, uh, Malina. Mm -hmm. As far as I can see, both your model and uh, LPT, sometimes LPT. Mm -hmm. I are using the one gluon exchange bone diagram, right? the, mm. the leading order PQC diagram. But uh, in your treatment, uh, in addition to, in your treatment, you have only a, a running coupling constant, uh, and, uh, plus a reduced uh, screening mass. But in LBT, they don't have that uh, reduced screening mass. Um, so, and, but I, I suppose I suppose both models uh, need to finally similar result, results uh, in terms of uh, high flavor absorbers. So, so what 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 are the differences there or not? Excuse me. The final question is yes. The res the final results are quite similar. I suppose. Yes, she didn't get maybe quite similar. I mean, yes, that, that's the difference, right? You you have both uh, both. Uh, Running coupling and uh, uh, reduced uh, screening mass, both would uh, amplify the finally the transport mm -hmm. efficient this interaction strength. But uh, the reduced mass is not uh, needed in the LPT approach. Yeah, he is asking about yes. the comparison with the yes, LBL right? approach. Yes. The LBL approach. Yes, we should probably go into. Details. I mean, also looking at the values. Of course, I, I don't remember in the LBT approach of of the effective coupling strength that also Paul was was asking about, right? Maybe Shanshan has an has an idea immediately. He is raising his hand, so maybe he can. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I agree with what you just said. So although we didn't uh, model the uh, the running uh, screening mass, but as I showed earlier, our RFS uh, changes with energy. So when energy comes down and also when temperature comes down, the RFS uh, goes up. So uh, our modeling the coupling strength there. So probably it will have some similar effect to uh, the nonce model where they uh, run on the, uh, on the mu D. So that's my uh, mm -hmm. quick opinion. And just a quick, uh, uh, quick, quick answer to post the earlier question. Sorry to use your time. So uh, we we uh, quickly checked our calculation. So uh, in principle, yes, it may uh, blow up. But in the final result that we extract for the alpha s uh, energy, our result is uh, finite. It's uh, smaller than 0.5 uh, at uh, at the heavy quark mass. Uh, heavy quark mass for the energy. So the result is uh, didn't blow up. So. Uh, concerning this reduced screening mass, okay, so it is important to understand that historically, and, and I'm glad that one of our father, Benjamin Zvetitsky, in the audience, 
So historically, what people put was indeed some kind of string in mass taken like a Dubai mass, okay? And with this Dubai mass, we, we, we could never reproduce the phenomenology of uh, energy loss in heavy air collision. Th th then we realized that if you do this HTL, what you get is a real genuine polarization tensor. And Andrea Berardo late, later on uh, really implemented in, in the modeling the full polarization tensor. And, and what we did was in the between, okay? We, we basically took the best reduced mass in, in order to reproduce this polarization tensor. So it was not done on purpose just to increase energy loss. It, it was done just to have a good agreement for the energy loss when you take the calculation with a full polarization tensor. So th this is where this kappa stems from. Okay, well, thank you. Sorry, I have to cut the discussion here. Maybe Please. this can be continued uh, in the plenary discussion at the end of the of this uh, evening. Uh, so thank you again, Marlene, for your talk. Sure, thank you uh, for listening. And uh, let's uh, go to the next approach that is PHSD. And uh, Tareso. Ah, uh, yeah, uh, wait a moment. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, I will talk about uh, elastic uh, heavy core interactions in coprom plasma uh, in uh, hot and hadron string dynamics. So, can you make a full screen, please? Oh. Uh, can you see? Yes. yes. Ah, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, let me first talk about uh, quark Coulomb plasma in PHSD. Uh, quark Coulomb plasma in PHSD is described by uh, so-called dynamical quasi-particle uh, model. And in this model, uh, the form of a quark gluon mass and the width uh, are taken from hard summer loop uh, calculations at high temperature limit. So quark, uh, quark mass is proportional to strong coupling G and the temperature, and the width is proportional to G square uh, temperature. So in, in some sense, uh, this is a, a high order correction. And the gluon is the same. Uh, gluon mass is proportional to GT, and uh, this is proportional to G square T. And this form uh, is valid uh, in large uh, temperature limit. So we uh, parameterize uh, strong uh, coupling constant, uh, not constant. It is a function of temperature and uh, baryon chemical potential. Uh, yeah, this is uh, our uh, parameterization for uh, parameterization for strong coupling uh, G square. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, this is the uh, latest version, and uh, it uh, depends on uh, entropy density, not uh, temperature. And S uh, is entropy density, and uh, S S B is uh, entropy density in Stefan Boltzmann uh, uh, limit. And so it is proportional to t to the third power. And we uh, introduced three uh, parameters, d, e, f, and uh, they are given uh, here, some numbers. And this uh, temperature dependent uh, learning coupling is extended to uh, baryon, uh, finite baryon chemical potential uh, by using this uh, relation. Um, yeah, the right side is uh, baryon free, uh, uh, strong coupling and the left side is uh, finite baryon uh, chemical potential. And the T star uh, is T uh, square T square plus uh, quark uh, chemical potential square divided by pi square. And the TC mu B means uh, critical temperature at finite uh, chemical uh, potential, uh, baryon chemical potential. And we introduce one more parameter alpha, uh, which is given here. Uh, so if uh, mu b is not zero, then t star uh, is larger than uh, t and uh, t c uh, small, smaller than uh, this uh, 
Tc at uh, zero chemical potential. So effectively, um, so this T star divided by Tc uh, is larger. Uh, it means that uh, our strong coupling uh, decreases uh, at a finite uh, chemical potential. And that is shown in the right figure, uh, strong coupling uh, as a function of temp uh, temperature, uh, um, the temperature divided by Tc. And uh, yeah, uh, we, yeah, I show you four different uh, cases, uh, baryon free and uh, 200 MeV and 400 MeV and 600 MeV. Uh, and uh, the comparison is uh, lattice research uh, for uh, uh, without uh, 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 quark, I mean, quenched uh, lattice quantity. And by using this uh, strong uh, coupling, parameterized strong coupling, we obtain the uh, quark and the gluon uh, polar mass, and also quark uh, spectral width and the gluon uh, spectral width uh, as a function of a temperature. And uh, by using this uh, quark, uh, spec, uh, quark and gluon spectral function, we uh, can reproduce uh, lattice uh, equation state. And not only at zero chemical potential, but also uh, finite uh, non-zero chemical, uh, baryon chemical potential. And you can see pressure and energy density, entropy density and uh, trace anomaly, everything uh, are well uh, reproduced. And yeah, uh, it's a short summary about uh, our coquelin plasma. Uh, coquelin plasma is composed of uh, uh, um, um, uh, quarks and gluons, uh, which have a spectral distribution. And uh, this spectral function is a function of energy and momentum. And uh, it is defined in heat uh, best frame in principle. But for our convenience, we uh, can simplify this spectral function to, to, into um, Lorentz, uh, Lorentzian form. Uh, I mean, now the spectral function is a function. Uh, spectral function uh, uh, function is a function of uh, invariant mass. So we can use this form in any frame. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we use this uh, simplified uh, spectral function uh, for our uh, charm study. Uh, let me move to uh, heavy quark uh, interactions in uh, quarkum plasma. Uh, we uh, calculate uh, yeah, these four uh, Feynman uh, diagrams. Uh, first one uh, is a heavy quark and light quark or uh, anti-light quark uh, scattering. And the other three is uh, heavy quark and gluon uh, scatterings. Uh, they uh, look like uh, yeah, very normal uh, familiar Feynman diagrams, but uh, there are a couple of differences. Uh, first, the uh, heavy quark uh, interacts with the uh, uh, offshore uh, massive uh, quarks and gluons. So this incoming uh, quark uh, as well as uh, outgoing quark or gluon uh, uh, do not have a fixed mass, but uh, has uh, uh, mass distribution. So um, the incoming uh, pattern and outgoing pattern, the mass of incoming uh, pattern and outgoing pattern are uh, sampled by Monte Carlo within uh, kinematically uh, allowed range. And the second uh, difference is uh, our strong coupling depends on uh, temperature and uh, uh, this um, the strong coupling is uh, large uh, near uh, critical temperature and uh, at high temperature, uh, strong coupling is small. And the last one is uh, that uh, the Exchange the gluon is uh, offshore uh, massive gluons. So we don't have uh, uh, any divergence problem and we don't have to introduce uh, screening mass. And this is our uh, scattering cross section for charm and uh, of quark. Yeah, just one example at, uh, yeah, as a function of temperature and uh, collision energy. And uh, the dependence on collision energy is uh, uh, mild, uh, almost flat, except to near uh, threshold energy. Uh, actually, this is integrated uh, cross-section. If you look at the uh, differential cross-section, uh, as uh, collision energy increases, then the uh, differential cross-section is more uh, forward-picked. But this is uh, in, uh, already integrated one. 
and uh, and uh, and as temperature decreases or approaches uh, critical temperature, uh, this cross section uh, rapidly increases because of uh, GT. Uh, as I said, the GT is a large uh, near uh, critical temperature. And so this yes, is uh, just comparison between charm and bottom uh, cross section. Uh, for uh, simplicity, I just took a pole mass. And uh, as you can see, the cross sections are not uh, much different from each other, just the uh, threshold energy is different. And the right side is a uh, differential cross section. And uh, uh, as you can see, the bottom cross section uh, is more uh, forward peaked because bottom is roughly three times heavier than uh, Chamcock. So uh, for the scattering is more uh, dominant. And uh, let me move to uh, transport questions. Yeah. Uh, from that uh, transition amplitude or uh, scattering cross section, you can calculate uh, um, transport coefficient. This is Hoch Planck equation, and A is drag coefficient or friction coefficient, and B is a momentum uh, diffusion coefficient. And uh, um, actually, there is a, a different uh, conven uh, convention. Uh, sometimes this, it, uh, uh, one half is located in front of a uh, diffusion coefficient. In that case, we don't have a one half here, and this one first uh, turns to uh, one half. I think uh, that is the case of our uh, present workshop. And, uh, but in our case, in, uh, P, uh, in dynamical quasi particle model, we have uh, two more uh, integrations uh, one for uh, incoming uh, pattern and uh, the other for outgoing uh, pattern mass. And we assume the heavy core has a constant mass. Uh, charm core is 1.5 GB and bottom 4.7 or 8 uh, GB. And uh, yeah, as I said, we use this uh, uh, Lorentzian uh, spectral function. And uh, yeah, compared with the only pole mass uh, without uh, width, uh, spectral function uh, decreases the transport coefficient to a, a drag and uh, diffusion coefficient it is uh, carried out by uh, uh, Hamza, our colleague, uh, uh, former colleague. And, yeah, um, and yeah, this is our numerical uh, research. Left side is uh, eta b, uh, which is uh, drag coefficient divided by uh, charm cone momentum um, as a function of uh, heavy cone momentum and the temperature. And uh, as you see, um, eta D decreases with uh, uh, heavy cone momentum, but uh, increases with the temperature. And the right side is Q hat uh, divided by uh, T to the third power, uh, and yeah, which is dimensionless. And uh, the behavior is uh, opposite uh, as momentum increases uh, the Q hat uh, decreases, uh, increases, and uh, uh, it decreases with the temperature. And the uh, spatial uh, diffusion coefficient is uh, defined like this, uh, temperature divided by uh, heavy quark uh, and eta d in the limit of uh, vanishing uh, zero uh, momentum. So we can uh, obtain this uh, spatial diffusion coefficient from this vertical uh, axis, zero momentum limit. and uh, this is our research uh, with, uh, in comparison with the uh, lattice uh, calculations. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Taiso, for your very clear talk. Uh, are there questions? Ralph? Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I really uh, like your, um, you know, offshore integrations over the parton uh, spectral functions. <clears throat> now you showed that your the width uh, that figure in these parton spectral functions for light partons are of the order 100 or 200 MeV, uh, right? Uh, you mean spectral width? Yeah, roughly like that. You showed it in the beginning, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so even less, yeah, about 100 uh, or so. Um, I was wondering how that width uh, compares uh, to the width that you get for your charm quark when you compute your uh, spatial diffusion coefficient or, or you know, friction coefficient, whatever. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, we, we assumed the constant mass. We didn't introduce the spectral risk to heavy quark. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that, uh, that, 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 no, yeah, that, that is fine. That is fine. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about uh, the effect of the width uh, on, uh, on the transport coefficient. For the, for the, that's the point of the heavy quarks, that you are safer there than for the light partons, right? Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering um, if you have ever checked uh, what the scattering width, not the thermalization width, uh, not the thermization rate, but the scattering rate of your heavy quarks is uh, compared to what you have uh, for the light uh, quarks. Um, yeah, I can yeah, compare uh, yeah, uh, the scattering uh, rate of uh, heavy coke and uh, light coke, but what is the right. physical minimum of that comparison? Well, uh, I would expect that, uh, you know, if you have, uh, um, for, for the DS values of order four or five or so, um, what, uh, what we find is uh, that the width is actually like 500 MeV or so, right? Or even more, the width will be for, for these relatively small values of ds of uh, you know uh, around below five. What typically uh, you find is, uh, and I don't know what is in your approach, but what you typically find uh, is the widths are 500 MeV or more. And uh, that uh, then I would uh, you know ask the question: Why are they different from the light uh, partons? <clears throat> but I don't know what it is. That, um... that, but uh, uh, Tessa, may yeah, I? Uh, I think. Um, Tessa, sorry. But in your uh, definition or gamma, your definition or gamma, sometimes there is a factor two that I uh, uh, didn't really get. I, it's not clear if you're 100, 200 MeV when you discuss it in terms of a bright Wigner is uh, a factor two smaller. That the real uh, um, width uh, with the bright Wigner is uh, 200, 300 MeV. If you go to the formula, I didn't get this. Uh, and uh, also, right. the, the yeah, our, uh, the scattering, sorry, the scattering rate is the scattering rate, right? Uh, there, there's no factor two or something, right? Yes, 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 but, yes, yes. No, but it's just in this definition that. Uh, was so you mean okay? You can go back to the spectral functions. How you find the gamma? That's what Enzo asked, huh? Yes. Uh, Ralf, I'm sorry uh, if I can add, there is a um, bit between scattering rate and this coefficient gamma, which is a width, there is factor of two indeed. Okay, so your, your light walk. And, uh, and also what I would uh, say, uh, what you asked, it was checked uh, in the beginning of our adventure by um, Hamza Berrera. And um, actually, I think we have this result, but I have to dig it. So yeah, it would be very interesting what your scattering rate of the John Fox is. Yeah, yeah, it was computed. Yes. And uh, yeah, I have one more comment about that. Uh, if scattering happens with a massive uh, pattern, then yeah, it, the number of scattering not. Uh, uh, I mean, that does not decide everything. I mean, what particle uh, with what particle scatter? Happens is also important. No, but that's the difference between the thermal. It affects diffusion coefficient. No, yeah, I understand. That is the difference between the thermalization rate and the scattering rate. And there's a large factor in between, of course, uh -huh. order 10 mm -hmm. for the uh -huh. heavy quarks, right? Mm -hmm. Because uh, even for light partons, there's a difference of factor three because you need three scatterings to isotropize, right? Yes, but uh, in your you case, need, uh, then you get what is the factor? mass of uh, right? Uh, what is the mass of a pattern, scattering pattern? Well, you, your masses are half GV, right? Uh, yeah, roughly around TC. No, I, I'm not talking about the thermalization rate. I'm talking about simply the scattering rate, which is what also figures in your uh, propagators that you show here, right? Yeah, but I'm saying uh, the scattering rate is uh, uh, does not decide everything. I mean, we should take into account uh, uh, how massive particle scatters of heavy quark. Yes, that, that is that is about, but that is not, you haven't understood my question then. Uh, I'm simply asking how often does a charm quark scatter? And I would like to compare that to how often, uh, you know, your light quarks scatter. That's all I'm asking. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I mean, maybe we don't solve this here, but it's, uh, uh, it will be very nice also for the discussion if uh, you can, uh, dig out before the end of the workshop this point. A last question from uh, Peter Petreschke. So uh, 
I was wondering uh, about the quark number susceptibilities and uh, uh, of dragon or susceptibility, so quark, uh, quark correlations. So did you consider that in, in your model and how, how do they fare in the model versus the lattice results? Um, yeah, we have a study about uh, quark susceptibility. I, uh, I didn't show here, but uh, if I remember correctly, it was not so bad. And uh, what about the quark quark correlations? And uh, did you look into that? Uh, I think we didn't study it. Um, okay. Peter, Thank let you. me uh, might be add to this. Uh, of course, uh, quark uh, susceptibilities we calculated, and there's uh, any uh, let's say quasi particle model of such type, we are missing something like 15, 20 percent. Uh, but it also depends on, uh, let's say, uh, how you adjust your model and so on. If you make um, a mass is dependent on momentum, if you make it, uh, we had some extended version of DQPM. So then you are doing better. Uh, but it's not for used for this charm study, which I saw reported. So that's why we don't show it here. And uh, mm, uh, cross acceptability, mm, it's in the progress, this work presently. Okay, thank you, Elena, for your comment. Uh, there is a very, okay, very, very quick question from Mine. If, uh... Yes, I, 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 so I want to ask um, uh, concerning the running, running coupling constants, like uh, in, in, in Malina's talk, they were using half a set function of t squared, the momentum transfer squared, right? Yes. But uh, in, in your Dynamical quasi-particle model that was a function of of of, of, of temperature simply. Yes, but that, that's some difference between temperature and uh, and uh, momentum transfer of, of course uh, because finally in calculating the transport coefficient you have to do momentum integration that means um, all momentum can contribute. Uh, uh, yes. Um, yeah. Um, it is my private. Uh, opinion if we move to a uh, large momentum tra transfer region, then we should uh, uh, use uh, learning coupling based, uh, scaled by uh, momentum transfer. But mm -hmm. uh, um, this lattice, uh, I mean, the equation of state uh, is uh, mainly in the region of uh, normalized uh, matter. I mean, we don't have uh, the large momentum transfer, doesn't have a large contribution to uh, our calculations. So. We can use this temperature-dependent coupling uh, at a certain range. But if we move to a very high uh, energy momentum transfer, then I agree. I think that we should use momentum transfer. Uh, it should be scaled at momentum transfer. OK, thank you, Taiso. I think is clear the answer. <clears throat> thank you again. And uh, we move to the last talk of this uh, session. Uh, that is the one. Uh, uh, from the Torino group. Um, I think there is uh, Andrea will talk. Okay, uh, let me just uh, share my slides. Okay. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, let me first of all thank uh, the organizer for uh, inviting uh, me and my collaborators to present uh, our uh, approach. And uh, I will try to more or less give uh, um, a flavor of uh, the main features of, of our approach also in the light of uh, what uh, has been already presented. And uh, okay, uh, this is just, uh, um, a reminder to clarify the setup. Of course, the most uh, my, my microscopic approach to discuss the evolution of the quark would be the one based on the Boltzmann equation, as long as the medium admits um, a description in terms of well-defined uh, quasi-particle excitations. But in any case, this could be also the starting point to understand uh, uh, the origin of the Fokker-Planck and Langevin equation, which uh, is already stressed uh, in the previous talks, uh, can be considered also more general. 
uh, under certain circumstances. In any case, the idea is that if you expand the collision integral uh, of, um, of, the, of the Boltzmann equation, uh, and you expand it for a small momentum exchange, you're left with the Fokker plug equation, uh, which is completely uh, defined in terms of uh, just uh, um, a, a, a few transport coefficient, uh, which are this uh, uh, friction coefficient and uh, these two momentum broadening coefficient uh, along uh, the transverse and the longitudinal direction. And the important point is that uh, the, the problem of describing the dynamics is reduced to the evaluation of these uh, three transport coefficient, which can be directly derived from the scattering matrix. Now, uh, the point is that you must make, uh, be sure that uh, your uh, Fokker Planck equation uh, uh, um, uh, describes the asymptotic approach to kinetic equilibrium. This is always the case for the Boltzmann uh, equation due to the H theorem, but uh, uh, this is something which has to be imposed uh, to the Fokker Planck equation. And uh, uh, in order uh, for this condition to be fulfilled, one has to uh, impose this uh, Einstein fluctuation dissipation relation that, uh, as you can see, uh, when uh, the longitudinal and uh, uh, transverse momentum broadening are different, and in principle they are, they are and uh, when uh, uh, they depend on the momentum, um, this uh, Einstein fluctuation uh, dissipation relation is uh, uh, a bit more um, complicated, complicated than uh, the one uh, in, uh, in the no relativistic setup. Uh, and this is the uh, this is, this occurs already at the level of the Fokker Planck equation. It's not something which is related to the discretization of the Nash-Raven equation. Uh, however, um, uh, in uh, for many practical uh, uh, applications, it is more convenient to rephrase the Fokker Planck equation as a Langevin equation. Uh, which uh, also uh, depends on three uh, uh, transport coefficient for which there is a one-to-one -one cor correspondence with the one uh, of the Fokker Planck, which are again a friction coefficient and the two momentum broadening coefficient along the longitudinal and transverse uh, direction, uh, which essentially uh, describes uh, the strength of this uh, stochastic noise term which enters into uh, the equation. And uh, the physical uh, meaning uh, is uh, clearly the, uh, the, the, the description of momentum diffusion and uh, of uh, friction. Uh, now, notice that uh, in the most general case, uh, this momentum diffusion coefficient depends uh, on, uh, on the momentum of the particle uh, besides on the temperature. And uh, this requires uh, some care uh, once uh, one uh, implements a, a numerical solution of, of the equation. Um, now, in order to do so, uh, it, is, uh, it is useful to define a dimensionless uh, Gaussian noise variable uh, with width uh, one uh, by factorizing this uh, tensor structure in the, in the noise term in the Langevin equation. Now, notice that uh, this uh, tensor, which uh, provides the strength of the noise, depends uh, on the momentum of the heavy particle. And uh, so, since this is a recipe to update uh, the momentum of the heavy quark, uh, there is some, ambi let's say, some degree of some freedom in uh, deciding where to evaluate uh, this quantity. And uh, in, in principle, you can uh, introduce this parameter xi, which can go from zero to one, and uh, you are able to, uh, to choose uh, whatever values you want, uh, but with the only caveat that then you must enforce uh, the asymptotic approach to thermalization. In the following, we will uh, use the so-called E top three point discretization scheme, in which for this uh, coefficient xi, we we take the value, the value zero. And uh, in this case, but only in this case, there is a, a, a complete equivalence between the friction term which enters into the Langevin equation and uh, the friction term 
which, uh, uh, which enters into the focal Planck equation and which is the one uh, with, uh, which satisfies this uh, um, Einstein uh, fluctuation dissipation relation and uh, which uh, uh, in principle can be also derived from the scattering matrix. However, since uh, this relation uh, has to be fulfilled, our choice in the following uh, and in general in our approach is to evaluate from the scattering matrix uh, in practice uh, the uh, transverse and longitudinal momentum broadening of the heavy quark and to fix the, fi the friction term by imposing uh, the Einstein fluctuation dissipation relation. I stress once more that uh, uh, this uh, ETO discretization uh, is the only scheme uh, in which uh, the, the friction term uh, which enters into the Langevin equation as a direct, uh, as a direct uh, um, physical interpretation in terms of something which can be uh, evaluated from the scattering matrix. Uh, now, um, uh, we have some freedom uh, on, uh, on the choice of the, mom of the momentum broadening coefficient and uh, historically we, we follow the two strategies, either to exploit the estimates which are provided by lattice QCD simulations and uh, which unfortunately refers only to, the, on to the, refer only to the case of a static heavy quark. Uh, and uh, more or less uh, for this value of the temperature uh, that this data uh, are uh, around uh, this value. Uh, but the other possible choice is to evaluate our uh, momentum broadening coefficients uh, somehow from uh, first principle or, of, of, at, or, um, in a, but uh, in a weak coupling uh, setup, so uh, with uh, some limitation. And our idea is essentially, even if I don't uh, provide the details of the calculation, but only the, the final result, is to introduce uh, some intermediate cutoff uh, on the form momentum exchange uh, in, uh, in the collisions, uh, um, form momentum intermediate cutoff of order of the Debye mass, and to treat uh, um, essentially hard scattering uh, in, uh, in with a kinetic approach, so evaluating the two to two uh, sc uh, scattering matrix, uh, where in this case, uh, the, the scale at which uh, alpha s is evaluated is the one of the four momentum exchange in the collision. And uh, to um, evaluate the, the, so the contribution of soft collisions with, within uh, our thermal loop, uh, perturbation uh, theory, and in this case, the, the scale at which uh, the, the coupling is evaluated is a scale which is proportional to the temperature. The message is that uh, once you merge together the two contributions, the dependence of this uh, fictitious uh, intermediate cutoff is very small, but what, what is not small is the difference, in particular, at large momentum between the transverse and longitudinal momentum broadening, in particular uh, in the case of charm quarks. While uh, this, uh, at least uh, for, P for momentum below 10, 10 GV, this, uh, this, this difference between the transverse and longitudinal is milder in the case of uh, bottom. Clearly, clearly, this has uh, some phenomenological consequences. Uh, and uh, the phenomenological consequences can be uh, uh, understood by comparing uh, the predictions of the, of the theoretical model with experimental data. And uh, as you can see, uh, the, the theoretical curves um, tend to, 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 to depart uh, uh, for uh, transverse momenta larger than uh, 4 GV, okay? And uh, so um, the, the direct of a momentum dependence uh, in the lattice QCD uh, transport coefficients don't uh, allow one to reproduce the, the RAA. On the other end, probably uh, the strong momentum dependence in the longitudinal momentum broadening uh, leads to 
perhaps a too strong uh, uh, saturation of the spectra. So perhaps the reality stays uh, in between. And the same uh, holds for, uh, for the elliptic flow coefficient. So uh, the message is that, and this is a message which was also suggested yesterday, that uh, it's, not it, it's not only important the value of the transport coefficient, but also their momentum dependence. Now I would like now to give an overview of, uh, of the sensitivity uh, on the transport uh, to the transport coefficients of other possible observables, and uh, a possible yes, observable yes, yes. Uh, are, uh, is related to the event shape engineering studies, in which uh, for you select uh, within a, a given centrality class uh, uh, events of uh, large or small eccentricity. And uh, once you take the ratio of the of the elliptic flow coefficient uh, in uh, with respect to the unbiased case, uh, essentially you see that this ratio depends uh, on the clearly on the transfer on uh, on the initial geometry uh, of the fireball, but uh, it it, uh, it displays a very weak dependence uh, on the transport coefficients. So essentially, uh, current event shape engineering observables are sensitive essentially to the initial eccentricity of the fireball rather than uh, on the transport coefficient. Uh, probably, and this uh, could be a suggestion, uh, the, a possible uh, observable within this setup, which can uh, provide a stronger sensitivity to the transport coefficients and uh, to the coupling uh, between the heavy quark and the medium, is to select event of the same uh, eccentricity, but belonging to different centrality classes. And uh, in, the ca in this case, uh, for the same uh, eccentricity of the fireball, you have a, a larger uh, V2 or V3 coefficients for uh, more central collisions. And uh, so this is something which perhaps um, can uh, give, provide a, a, bet, a better a strong, uh, information on uh, the coupling between heavy quarks and, um, uh, and the medium. Then a particular, a peculiar role uh, concerning the sensitivity on the transport coefficient is also the one uh, of the, uh, the directed flow D1. This is a, an example. You see that the V1, and this is, has been known for at least uh, three or four years uh, since the work by the Catania group and also by the works by Bozek. Uh, uh, the, 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 the V1 uh, uh, coefficient of the meson is much stronger than the one uh, of uh, soft hadrons. And this is due to the fact that there is this uh, initial uh, spatial asymmetry between the heavy quark distribution uh, with respect to the tilted five ball. And uh, notably, uh, I think it's quite uh, interesting, uh, since uh, um, the, the spatial diffusion coefficient is, uh, it gets very small uh, as uh, the coupling with the medium gets larger, and so as kappa gets large, uh, the heavy quark tend to, uh, tend to flow the, the motion of uh, the original fluid cell. And so the, uh, the peculiarity of the direct flow is that while, uh, for instance, the elliptic flow for strong coupling, for, so for strong value of the, um, of the transport coefficient that tend to relax to the cooper fry uh, spectrum, uh, and uh, at least for, uh, for a small uh, uh, PT, there is uh, not so, such a strong sensitivity to exact value of the transport coefficient. Uh, here you can see that uh, uh, for very large tra uh, transport coefficient, uh, we, we have taken also values which are 10 times uh, the, the one provided by Lettis QCD estimates. Uh, we, you see that uh, we are very far from the Cooper Fry limit. And uh, I mean, and, and also the, the sensitivity on, uh, on the transport coefficient is uh, stronger than uh, the one can be, which can be observed, for instance, in the elliptic flow at the small uh, PT. And then uh, finally, oh, yes. let me check also a bit the sensitivity on the, on the initial spectrum. And this is really some uh, uh, toy calculation, which I performed uh, in, in these days, just taking uh, uh, transport coefficients, which are just a coefficient uh, times p to the cube, and uh, taking uh, some uh, idealized uh, background uh, hydrodynamic uh, uh, scenario, which is always the same, which is uh, given by this uh, Gupser flow. 
and uh, what uh, I did here, it, uh, it is uh, just uh, to, to start from two different spectra. One is uh, the one of a phone and L calculation at 200 GV, and one uh, it's uh, the, uh, the phone calculation at 5 uh, TD. And as you can see, um, in the first case of, with a softer spectrum, one uh, uh, approaches more easily thermalization than uh, in the case of a harder spectrum in which uh, in an, even with the strongest uh, transport coefficient uh, after a three uh, GV, one uh, strongly departs from, uh, from thermalization. Uh, and then also the, also the qualitative structure of, of the RIA is very sensitive to the initial spec, spectrum. Uh, this uh, intermediate uh, bump uh, due to radial flow is present uh, in the, with a, a softer initial spectrum, but it's not present with, uh, um, at a larger, at higher center of mass energies. And uh, uh, a last point, which I would like to stress, and which was also uh, which was also briefly mentioned in the talk by Andre Dainez yesterday, is the fact that there is also uh, a, a, a source of systematic uncertainty coming uh, from uh, the um, from the uh, from the, the the scale at which the initial spectrum is evaluated. And uh, here in this uh, slide, uh, you you can see. Uh, the RIA for uh, the same values of uh, transport coefficient from one from one to five uh, t cube, but uh, you can see that uh, the, 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 essentially the the, the the bands corresponds to the uncertainty in the initial spectrum arising from the possible choices of factorization and the renormalization scale, and as as you can see somehow in the most interesting uh, region uh, from the theoretical point of view, so from from zero to three GV of transverse momentum, uh, the uncertainty related to the choice uh, of the factorization and renormalization scale in your initial spectrum is larger than the uncertainty on the exact value of the transport coefficient. So um, um, the message I would like to say that uh, it's also important to have uh, under a very good control the, ini the initial spectrum from, when, from one, uh, uh, one starts, uh, from which one starts. Uh, and perhaps uh, it, it is also important to, to take into account not, not only theoretical prediction, but also the most up-to-date uh, experimental uh, data and i think this is more or less uh, everything that i wanted to say this is uh, this yes, was yes. just to illustrate the that time uh, is over andrea <laughs> very good <laughs> okay very good thank you for your talk there were also several interesting things in the last part will be could be the case also to go there uh, in the discussion at the end of the day there is a question from peter it's more a comment. Uh, so it would be good when you refer to the lattice results to specify which particular do you mean? I mean, there are several ones on the market and, and now the recent lattice results that William showed, they extend to large temperature range. I mean, you see actually some temperature dependence or those errors are quite large. So that's, that's why it's important when you say twice the lattice. I mean, the lattice itself has a factor two error in what you mean by kappa. So so just just to be more precise when you put any band. Yes, uh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Uh, we, we have not included yet uh, in our approach uh, the most uh, uh, up-to-date uh, lattice estimates. Uh, and uh, the, the estimates that we put are quite old. They, they are from... Yes, the, the other thing is that, of course, the lattice is quenched, so, so somehow somehow kappa itself could change when you go yes, from quench and quench. And which, if, if, you, if you kind of stay in the perturbative framework, you actually could, uh, uh, could estimate how much it changes by adding three light flavors to, in addition to the gluons. So in, in a way, you could say, well, let's take the perturbative result for NF equals zero, uh, more kappa k factor, which would be the difference between your leading order perturbative result and the lattice, and that would be kind of your lattice motivated or, or renormalized lattice results for full QCD, uh, which uh, of course you could have, uh, uh, you could also then, then take into temperature effects. The other question is, is more general. I mean, we're talking about transport coefficient here. Uh, 
and, and the momentum dependence of the transport coefficient. So in a sense, we are talking about uh, the transport, the notion of the transport coefficient is a bit loose. I mean, those are the parameters that enters Langevin or Fokker Planck dynamics. Strictly speaking, and that comes back to the question of, of whether you have momentum dependence as a transport coefficient, strictly speaking, defined in the momentum equal zero limit. And you see that when you go to heavy quark mass like the bottom, for small momenta, I mean, there is no difference between KT and KL. And, and of course, the momentum dependence is rather mild. So strictly speaking, kappa and D are only defined in, in, in the zero temperature limit, or zero momentum limit. Yes, Peter, indeed. I fully agree. The fact that we call Langevin the one with the momentum dependence is a little bit uh, a phenomenological way to extend uh, the Langevin, but uh, with transport coefficients. But uh, and in fact, I mean, it, it could be could be valid, right? I mean, yes, you yes, yes. One could always get it, but but it's just just what you call a transport coefficient. One has to be careful, right? But, but in general, nothing guarantees you then uh, if you want the fluctuation dissipation, you can have uh, that your matrix element at finite momentum, uh, I mean, as BL and BT, very different. I mean, there is much more rich dynamic. Uh, than... oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, question from Ralph. Yeah, very quick. Um, can you briefly elaborate? I mean, in principle, you, uh, my understanding is you have a similar model set up for uh, the heavy quark uh, parton scattering than uh, say Nantes uh, has, but uh, it seems your the matching scale, the T-star and the implementation of the Debye mass uh, are, are different. Is that, uh, is that true? And uh, if so, um, it would be very interesting to compare quantitatively uh, the differences. Now, uh, do you refer to the fact that we choose a, a, a scale at which uh, we evaluate uh, the, the coupling in, this, in the arc scattering and another scale in which we treat, uh, for with, when we treat uh, soft scattering processes? Is, yes, is, those two scales, yes. Yes, yes. So, so um, well, what we did was uh, to evaluate uh, in the arc scattering, the alpha S was evaluated essentially at, uh, at, uh, at the, 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 the Mandelstam va va uh, variable T, uh, so at, at, at the scale. So mu, mu square is equal, equal to T, where T is the square the momentum exchange in the collision. Um, while uh, for soft scatterings, which in principle involves uh, the, the, the exchange of uh, long wavelength uh, gluons, we relied uh, on, uh, on expressions uh, provided by our thermal loop uh, approximation. And in this case, uh, the, the scale was given uh, by the temperature. We, we choose uh, a value of the scale, which usually is uh, in, at the middle uh, of, the, of the band of variation, uh, which is explored usually in uh, thermal field theory calculations. I, I think I understood that, but my, my main question was, uh, do you think that is quite different from the Nantes approach or quite similar? Uh, well, uh, we, we don't, uh, it, uh, with respect to Nantes approach, sorry, I, this, I missed the, your point in, in, in your question. Well, with respect to Nantes approach, we don't essentially uh, introduce uh, this uh, factor which uh, reduces somehow the, the screening mass uh, and so enhances a, a bit uh, enhanced significantly uh, some transport coefficients. So we, we don't reduce artificially the, um, the screening mass in, in some uh, denominators. So this, this is a, a, a difference with respect to, to, to Nant approach. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will not maybe agree about the word artificially. No, no. On, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. It was not uh, to the, in a negative um, in a negative sense. Of, uh, no. You explained very well uh, uh, the, your philosophy. Uh, sorry. But but you also do not rely on this self consistent Debye mass. Do, 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 do no 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 no. You're right. Yes. Uh, the, we we take the Debye mass, which is uh, GT times uh, the coefficient depending on the number of colors and flavors, and uh, the G is the coupling evaluated at uh, at the scale uh, proportional to the temperature and not uh, as was uh, discussed in the presentation uh, by Marlene. But in any case, I, I think Ralph is right that at, at some point we basically it would be interesting to, to compare Absolutely. what are the consequences of the choice of the parameters into the I, I fully agree with you, Ralph. 
Okay, so we close uh, this session. We.